Watch this. What was once a bustling place for race fans has now sat empty for seven years. Now Ada County is asking for input on what to do with the old Livois Track Club. A neighborhood landmark was stolen in the middle of the night. And after our story aired, the original artist reached out and has offered a solution. And remembering our longtime friend and colleague, Larry Gebert, who left this world far too soon. We take a look back at the goofy guy we all knew and loved for so many reasons. Welcome to the 208. We have some late breaking news for you on Friday afternoon. Here's what we got. Idaho's Texas style abortion ban, formerly known as Senate Bill 1309, is now officially on hold, at least for now. Planned Parenthood of Greater Northwest says that the Idaho Supreme Court has just blocked the law, which has not gone into effect yet. It was supposed to go into effect April 22nd, which is 30 days after it was originally signed by Governor Brad Little. Here is the court order that is blocking the law for now. Now, the bill uh, would have banned all abortions after six weeks and would allow immediate family members, including siblings, grandparents, aunts and uncles, to sue a doctor should they perform an abortion in Idaho. And the court ruled that this is a pause to give both sides more time to prepare for the expected legal battle in the Idaho Supreme Court. Planned Parenthood asked the court to put a pause on letting the bill become law in order to give them, as well as the Supreme Court, some more time to prepare for an expected legal battle. The Idaho Attorney General's office, they asked for more time as well. And long story short here, Planned Parenthood said they were cool with more time being given to both sides if the law was blocked temporarily, which is exactly what has happened here. So both sides will now have a few weeks to study the issue, gather info, write up their briefs, and then submit them to the court for their consideration. We'll keep you posted as all of this goes along. But again, if you're just joining us here at 5 o'clock, the Idaho Supreme Court has just announced that they will block the new Idaho abortion bill from going into effect pending developments in court. Well, if you're in Ada County looking for a big business opportunity, you may be in luck. L luck, I should say. Excuse me. Listen to this. Ada County is requesting submissions from business entities that are interested in leasing the Turf Club at Expo Idaho. The Turf Club, you remember that? It used to host horse racing events as well as live betting and race simulcasts. That all went away in 2015, and in 2018, Idaho voters said they wanted to keep it that way. So no more betting on horses as Lebois, as many of you know. Since then, though, thousands of square feet have essentially just sit empty. But Ada County commissioners are exploring a change, and they tell us in a statement, quote, the board is committed to supporting innovative business opportunities that allow for the best and highest use of our facilities at Expo Idaho. We are eager to hear about and evaluate ideas brought to us that would provide a robust revenue stream for the county and allow us to partner with organizations that bring value to all the residents of the county. And we'll show you some pictures from the space itself. Here's the outside that you may be familiar with. Now inside, it's two levels with a total of about 1,300 square feet. It is usable space. There's also that paved parking lot out in front. If any of these pictures spark joy or spark excitement for you, you can go ahead and pitch an idea through May 2nd to Ada County. And we have details on this posted online through the Ada County social media pages and their website. We'll also be sure to link to that as well on our website. And if you did want to learn more about all of this, there's an informational meeting coming up on April 20th at 1.30 at that turf club. Now, organizers say that the purpose of the meeting is to allow potential respondents to get there, ask questions, go see the facility, and they can clarify anything with maintenance and administrators there regarding the goals of the facility and what it's capable of. We will be following all of this. It should be interesting to hear about what they could do in this great space. It's all exploratory right now. By the way, if you're wondering, this is technically in Ada County. It is not in Garden City, contrary to some popular belief. Well, it happens once in a while. A really weird or bad smell emerges from the area around the Boise Mall, and it's happening again, at least according to Rob. Rob writes to us, what is the follow-up on the smell at Dairy Gold? It is getting horrible again. Well, here's what we can tell you today. When this happened back in October, we called the Department of Environmental Equality, DEQ, 
to see if they had reports on the smell. And they sure did. The same reports we got, same reports we're still getting. Something smells like raw sewage out there. Well, the DEQ, they pinpointed the smell and the general cause, and it was all tracked to a very familiar place, the Dairy Gold facility on Allenbaugh in Boise, close to the mall. Now, DEQ tells us that a problem with sewage and wastewater was causing the stinky issue. In the city of Boise, they were working on the issue with the facility, and there is still treatment going uh, underway there. Now, the smell still there, but the goal is to get it out as quickly as possible. In terms of air quality and possible violations, DEQ had told us that it is unpleasant, but there are no violations, nothing toxic or hazardous in the smell. It's just it's inconvenience, it's a nuisance as they call it. A DEQ, they did investigate the whole thing and they tell us that Dairy Gold continues to work on the issue. And according to the West Boise Sewer District, who's in that area, they maintain that. They tell us Dairy Gold still working on it as far as they know. We reached out to Dairy Gold for some more insight on their end. We did not hear back right away. We're hoping to get more insight soon. Again, though, the odor you may be smelling is talk. It's not toxic, but yes, it does smell bad. Not toxic, not, ha not hazardous, but I got a nice whiff of it last night. Thumbs down. I know what you're saying. Well, it's Friday, which means we're calling back some of the most popular stories of the week, including one involving crime, something we don't normally cover on the 208, but this one it was different, maybe because it resonated with so many. Over the weekend, someone stole a neighborhood icon, an Eastern Island head from Boise's North End. And while the theft was itself pretty brazen, the neighborhood lost more than just the value of the object. They say this violation took away some yearly traditions. Oh my God, I can't believe somebody would take that. Why take something that brings joy to a neighborhood? Senseless. For over a year and a half, this empty hole was home to an Eastern Island Maui statue in front of this North End home. I was like, this must be April Fool's. But today, I was shocked. Like I, yeah, I just, I stopped in my tracks. I was like, I can't believe that big statue is gone. Yeah. Like I, I had to do a double take. This busy corner that welcomed hundreds of neighbors near and far sits quiet and empty. And I can't even count the number of times that we would be out gardening or just hanging out and somebody would stop and strike up a conversation because it's just this like kind of um, goofy little piece of like silliness. The Goodrich family said the statue spoke to them when they saw it was being thrown away years ago. So they gave it a home of their own and a look that changed with the holidays and the seasons. And it was like a landmark, like people came by to see what he was wearing next. And my daughter was actually like kind of possessive of like how things had to be on him. It was like, it was her little buddy. She actually named it Kira. So if you ask her, she would um, very uh, stringently tell you that it's a girl. Five days ago, overnight, someone or some people dug the nearly 100 pound statue, Kira, out of its place. And with it went some longtime community traditions. It's like salt in the wound because it's not something that's useful to anybody else. It's just something that we kind of embraced as a neighborhood. As word of the statue's disappearance spread on social media, upset neighbors started posting their own messages demanding its return. Oh, we will find you. Yeah, the mailman's all over. They will find you. And I'll let all my people know too. Now, many just want to bring the Maui statue and all that came with it back in time for the Easter holiday. Just bring it back, no questions asked, stick it back on the corner and we'll all be happy and nobody has to be mad and upset about this. Just bring it back. So there is some good news for you. The statue, which you heard, they had nicknamed Akira. It still hasn't been returned, but people across Idaho saw this story and they reached out to help, including a man from Hagerman. So we got a call yesterday um, from the artist who created the statue. He recognized it on the news story and he just offered to bring a new one? Yeah, when I saw it on TV, I felt like it was my job to go, that's my statue and all these people are upset and, and, and it was getting so much attention, I just had to do something. I have the mold, so I, I can make one every once in a while. I'm so thrilled to see the exact same one again. I'm so thankful to um, Garen for bringing us this replica. It's really, Awesome, he's kind of an angel. 
I'm glad I can make a right out of something that's a bad thing, you know. Well, I hope it stays here and people like it. There's lots of kids here to enjoy it. We'll get the Easter bunny ears back out and maybe we'll have time to get the Easter basket full of treats out. This time around, I think we're gonna, um, we're gonna have a few more anti-theft um, measures in place. Oh, perfect timing just for Easter weekend coming up. Now, Garen, the artist, he tells us he actually hasn't made the statue itself for over 15 years, but he knew he still had the mold and he wanted to do something for the family, but he says this is a one-time thing. He says he's too old to keep up with making these statues for a living. Still no update on what happened to the original statue. I talk to people all the time who are sad to see it go. So you think of all the wonderful things that have happened in this place, and you say, you know, I'm going to miss that. But there's always an end, and I know that's for all of us. After nearly 60 years of memories, the Mardi Gras Ballroom in Boise will close its doors for the final time tomorrow night. In November of last year, owner uh, Lydia Merrill died at 106 years old, and the family decided no one could keep running it better than Lydia did. So. For 64 years, Lydia and her husband, Orson, welcomed well-known bands and hosted more events than anyone can remember after buying the building in 1958. Tomorrow night, they will open their doors for one final time. And the events tomorrow, they start at 6 o'clock with music itself starting at 7. Tickets are $20. They will not be sold at the door, so make sure you grab them beforehand. And a portion of the proceeds will benefit Metro Meals on Wheels. The family says that they will list the building for sale in the near future. We like to keep up with what's happening on Capitol Hill, especially if it involves Idaho. Unfortunately, there was an Idaho related story on Capitol Hill this week, but it involved a former Idaho reporter getting bit by a fox on Capitol grounds. Now, for several days, a fox attacked a total of nine people on Capitol Hill in D.C., and that includes a congresswoman from California and a former reporter from the Idaho Statesman, Jimena Bustillo. She now covers agriculture for Politico in Washington, D.C., and she was actually the last to be bitten before that fox was captured. I was just walking home in, like, plain sight of everybody, and I feel the, the nip, like, on my ankle, like that, like my leg was moving and it bit me, and I screamed incredibly loud. <laughs> And I like whipped around and the fox ran in front of me and I took my backpack and I just like <laughs> swung and swung at it. And I thought it was gonna like jump at my face or something. I think I was the last one that it got and I think I was the worst one. It drew blood. Were you concerned at that point about any sort of repercussions from this other than the scratching and the bleeding? Like if I had rabies? Yeah, I mean, was that a concern from the beginning? I think so. I, okay. think, I think the first thing that I thought was, what am I supposed to do? 
Crazy story out of D.C. Now that fox, by the way, was later put down and found to be rabid, meaning it had rabies. Jimenez one rabies shot into her four series booster shot schedule, and she's going to get another one tomorrow, we're told. But today, oh boy, another day. Now this picture drawn by Matt Worker, it's, there's a lot going on here in, in the D.C. area, a little bit of a political cartoon. Here's what we're going to zoom in on here, though. It's Jimena, and the title of this says Rabies on Capitol Hill. It explains so much, but you can see our friend Jimena there sitting on the ground in a pink top, looking at her ankle that got injured. She's now changed her profile picture on Twitter to this image. So, uh, Jimena, if you're watching, best wishes to you. Good luck with your shot tomorrow, but there we go. Cute little cartoon to remember it all. Well, this week we've been paying tribute to our colleague and our friend and everyone, a man who everyone loved, I should say, Larry Gebert. He did pass away this last Friday after complications of a heart attack that he suffered last Wednesday. And when we first heard about it, there wasn't anyone in this building that didn't think Larry would be back for the morning show on the following Monday with a great story about everything that had happened. But instead, we've had to come to terms with the fact that Larry will not be back here with us. And the last week has been filled with stories and memories of a man that many considered the face of the Treasure Valley television industry for so long. And he left us so much to remember. There's the superficial stuff, of course, his great mustache that we all loved, uh, the comb over that I borrow on a daily basis, of course, his beautiful Dockers, I'm wearing mine today. A lot of great things about Larry that you just, you saw on the outside, but Larry was so much more. He was such a part of so many people's lives and people really just learned so much from Larry, and Larry touched so many lives. Do you know who I am? When the movie Anchorman came out in 2004, you weren't alone when you thought, well, that's obviously Larry Gebert. I'm kind of a big deal. Really? People know me. Yeah, lots of people knew Larry, either from his morning show antics. I've always wanted to do this on camera, so. 
Oh my gosh. All right, See? That's lovely. Larry with his pants down. To another kind of streaking, his consecutive weeks on water skis. 995 weeks in a row, long enough to fill 18 years. Over that same stretch, Larry had a lot of people honor him in some rather off the green wall ways. Remember Flat Larry? Oh, the places he would go, packed and transported from burger joints to the Big Island. Can you tell which is the real one? Then there were those three-dimensional ones, too. The, the height might give it away. Like the time Mountain View High School junior Mallory Cowell came up with the perfect Halloween costume. You did a great job with that. That looks good. It was good. really good, Jeff. Did you yeah. style that yourself? Um, I, I just got it at Savers. Um, <laughs> and I just I'm gonna get used a, a lot of hairspray. <laughs> yeah, so do I. Hairspray helps. <laughs> or when Scott Burney tattooed Larry to his upper leg. No, I would agree that I'm not a celebrity on the same level as Johnny Cash or Marilyn Monroe or anything along those That's lines. That's up for debate and for what, some people. For there, some yeah. people, yeah, <laughs> exactly right. And I said, and I said, and most people out there would feel the same way. I said, but to you, it was something you wanted to do. And your explanation was great because you're you're an Idaho native. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. so born and raised, you just wanted something that spoke to you about Idaho. That represented the gem state, and I couldn't think of anything better. It was truly a one-of-a-kind commemoration. Now, has there been a big demand for this tattoo now that you've done that you've created it on Scott? Oh, um, you know, you would, you would think you would think that I would do more Larry tattoos, but um, has there been anybody at all who's asked for it uh, besides Scott? Mm, <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. I did want to say thank you too for actually adding more hair than what I really had. <laughs> there was the action figure, and a figure with a little less action. Last month, morning show viewer Blue sent this in. He had just retired and had taken up carving. And Larry was his first celebrity attempt. Larry, of course, was honored. Cause yeah, come to think of it, Larry was kind of a big deal. Larry went from a consecutive weekly streak of uh, water skiing, which ended in 2018, to a consecutive monthly streak, which actually ended in January of this year. But his whole streak together lasted 21 years. Oh, and there's one more, a late addition to the late Larry Gebert legend. How many of us can claim to have our tribute paid by a perfect puppet? And of course, we're being joined by the one and only Gary Lebert, broadcaster extraordinary. Now, Gary, I'm guessing you're an extraordinary broadcaster because you have a mustache? Exactly. And actually, in journalism school, that's what they taught us. Never leave home without an extra mustache, because you never know when you're going to need one. You never know when you're going to need one. Well, Larry's impact on viewers was one thing, but getting a forecast where your weekend was always in view paled in comparison to the impact Larry had on nonprofits here in the Gem State. There won't be a St. Alphonsus Festival of Trees, a Spirit of Boise Balloon Classic, a United Way Flapjack Feed, a Snake River Stampede Buckaroo Breakfast to benefit 4-H, a Boys and Girls Great Dolphin Dunk, Neighborhood Works, Paint the Town, a Boise Rescue Mission, Thanksgiving Banquet, Salvation Army, Stuff the Bus Toy Drive, or a Make-A-Wish Polar Bear Plunge. Seven Cares will also never be the same without Larry Gebert. And that legacy will last forever. Over his 30 years at Channel 7, he helped raise millions of dollars that improved the lives of countless people in our community. It's an honor to sign a proclamation making Larry's birthday, June 25th, Larry Gebert Day in the city of Boise. It'll be a day for acts of service, big and small, and help us remember Larry in action every day. We can honor him by finding a person, a group, an organization that needs help or a helping hand. Let's do our part to make sure Larry's legacy of giving continues for generations to come in the city of Boise. So mark your calendars. On Saturday, June 25th, the day will be known as Larry Gebert Day in the city of Boise. You can find a nonprofit that's close to you and your heart, and you can give your time or resources, really anything to help make a difference. Because we know that's what Larry did his entire life and had continued to do until he couldn't. Everyone is also invited to pay their respects to Larry this coming Tuesday, April 12th, at the Cathedral of the Rockies near downtown Boise. His service will start at 10 o'clock in the morning. If you cannot make it to the service, we will be streaming it live on KTVB.com.
All right, let's put Friday to bed with some of your comments and questions. What do we got here on the 208 Tron? All right, this person says we can all learn something about class from the gentleman in Hagerman. Yeah, he drove like an hour and a half just to do something nice. So thank you to uh, everyone involved in that story. That was a very interesting one. And then we got this one. I met my wife Shanna at the Mardi Gras in December 21st, 1974. Brings back a lot of memories. That's from Rick on the 208. Yes, they're closing up shop this weekend. So head down to the Mardi Gras for the final event and we will have some coverage for you from that, I believe. Uh, but before we let you go into the weekend, I want to introduce you to one of the newest members of the KTVB family. This is a four legged friend, so be excited. This is Calliope and Calliope is a cute Corgi that is just going to make your day beautiful into the evening. What a sweet pup. We will see you guys on Monday. Take care of each other this weekend.